So this is the Roland D50 from 1987, and it is Roland's first delve into the wholly digital domain. So what makes this synthesizer special as compared to uh, the JX3P, which we covered last week, the link is in the description, um, is that this is the first synth that combined uh, what has now become the formula of sample plus synthesis. So the uh, research engineers at Roland did some psychoacoustic work where they realized that the human brain perceives what a sound is mostly in the very beginning, the first few milliseconds of sound. And then from there, sort of your brain to so save resources stops paying attention. You can think of it in a sense. So what they found was, is although they couldn't afford at the time, sample space was super expensive. Um, so they couldn't afford to put long samples of say a violin or a cello in, but what they could do is they could, um, let's see if I can pull up some strings here, uh, real quick. Uh, let's go find some. Yeah. So what they could do is actually load just the very beginning of the sound and use that sample and then transition into traditional synthesis like we all know and love. So, you know, uh, oscillator into filter into amplifier modified by envelopes and LFOs. So with this sound, you can hear... You can hear that at the very beginning of the sound, there's like this little transient from the sound of the, you know, like a string section hitting that. And that enables there to be this, you know, realism to the sounds. But what's so cool about the D50 is you've got these 8-bit uh, PCM samples, post pulse code modulation samples, which is uh, sort of what we had going on with the Roland U20 that we checked out a couple of weeks ago. Um, but you've really only got that at the beginning. And so then you can then use traditional synthesis like pulse width modulation on square waves to get these sort of hybrid sounds that I think to this day still don't have a rival. So let's move on to like this metal harp. So you get these really uh, intoxicatingly realistic sounds, but they have this feeling to them that is not quite like listening to PCM samples. Um, so yes, yes, yes. I'm going to catch up with chat here. Let's talk a little bit about the beer of the evening. So I am going to be drinking this Ace California limited release craft cider. So it's a pumpkin cider, you know, every stream in September and October, I'm going to be drinking something pumpkin. And uh, so, yeah, let's check this out. Gluten-free vegan, no sugar added. Pretty cool. The ingredients are only apple juice, flavors and spices. So that's pretty neat. A little bit of little bit of sulfite. So I wanted to cheers to you guys for being amazing out there. Thank you for being scum. We do this every Wednesday at nine. Let's get this party started. Hmm. We should definitely make a cheers emoji. So that's another thing. We just added memberships to the channel. Uh, so if you want those sweet emojis, go ahead and consider that. Let's see. I got some uh, Mike and the Mechanics pads prepped for me, right? <laughs> so unfortunately, Shane, I saw that you commented you wanted me to uh, dissect a pad that was used with a D50, and I think you said a DX7. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to do that this stream. I just, uh, I also run a workout group that I've horribly timed to always happen right before these streams happen. So I've got that that I do before this, and so I, I ran out of time. I hope you'll apologize, uh, or I hope you will accept my apologize. Apology, Jesus, fuck. The Gamelon Bell. 
you can hear there's like some inharmonic inharmonic component And so what we can also do is control the partials here. So this is a way that we can kind of crossfade between the different layers, like on the Prophet VS or on the Korg Wave Station. You can hear there's some uh, amount of ring modulation being applied there. Like that one, you can really hear that on that note, there's some ring mod that's giving it that inharmonic content. Um, so let's see, let's catch up, let's catch up. Has anyone tried the boutique version of the D50? I have not, but it sounds really good. Interestingly, um, Anders Jensen did a video on the boutique version of the JD800, which we're gonna be doing next week. Uh, and that's really exciting. And although the JD-08, which is the boutique version of the JD-800, sounds good, it doesn't actually sound like the JD-800, which is kind of crazy to me because you would think a digital synth, they should be able to like nail perfectly. When I heard the examples done by Eric Persing from Spectrasonics on the D-50 versus the D-05, I think is what it's called, the boutique version, um, it, it sounds pretty much like spot on. So I was surprised when I heard the JD 800 didn't sound exactly the same. Espen Croft claims that the, uh, the way the D 50 crunches the numbers is different than in the D 05 and that he can hear a difference to my ears. I don't really hear it. So, um, all <laughs> you're kind of missing the beautiful shoulder blade shots. Oh my God. Uh, yes, it is pumpkin Wednesday. So let's chat about this beer real quick. Um, all three keyboards are not part of the D50. I've got my trusty wave station here, currently not hooked up, uh, tragically. And then I've got, you know, my boy, the, uh, the Korg wave station. Hey, uh, dub station zero. Thank you very much for becoming a member. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Welcome to the stream too, by the way. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah, cool. I think I got something else. I don't know if my uh, chat's coming up all the way there. So I also have the Poly 6 here. And I pulled up a string sound on the Poly 6 as a good like kind of comparison when we get to some of the string stuff, like what the difference in tone between an old analog synth and a new digital synth when we're comparing the 80s. So I think these synths only came up, came uh, about six years apart, but the technology was just rushing forward so fast. Um, so anyways, let's go find, where was I? Let's go, woof. Yeah, here we are. Let's go to Glass Voices real quick. So a very famous patch, it was used in Star Trek The Next Generation in the intro. Uh, so let's go ahead and try this out. some of the dodgiest playing I think I've done on this channel, but you get the point. The sound is awesome. <laughs> the playing is shit, but the sound is awesome. Oh yeah. So, uh, welcome. Love to see that little vulture skull next to your name, Dubstation Zero. How's it going? Uh, so let's go through a couple more things and we'll do some comparisons too. Hollowed harp here. You hear a sort of brassy component, reminds me of the brass sound from the K1. Let's see if I can control. So we can control now the balance of these uh, partials. So this is this sort of 
really th- thin kind of uh you know like a like a xylophone type sound and then we can crossfade over here i know it says harp but to me that's like kind of like a brass type sound and so like if we were scoring a movie or a tv show let's say we could kind of keep our finger on this and kind of crossfade between You know, and get kind of where we wanted the type of blend uh, that we had going. So um, one thing I wanted to say about the synth, too. Do you record the rumors of the synth being recorded into your computer? It is running directly into probably a Behringer ADA 2800, something like that. And then that's running into my RME uh, Babyface, which is then ran into Reaper. So I do not record the room. If you hear anything like uh, key sounds, like like that, that's just being picked up on this microphone, but you'll notice that when I press a key, um, that my voice should get side-chained out of the way, so you really can't hear me as well, to try to avoid that situation where sometimes when I've recorded videos and I don't do that, you do hear the keys, and that's kind of annoying to me. Um, And also, you know, a lot of these keyboards, they have pretty, like the wave station's key bed's not great. Like you really can hear it when it pops up. And uh, I love the synth, but that's just not, it's, you know, the good thing is with the wave station, you mostly just hold down notes, right? You don't go too crazy with it. So, um, but yeah, I don't, I try not to, uh, I don't do anything with like recording the sound because I think it would like lose it too, because even with great monitor speakers and a treated room, you're still not really going to hear it. So, uh, what is it? It's, um... You know, a little bit of, uh, of that action, uh, there. So one thing I want to talk about too, though, is that these membrane switches tend to go out on vintage synthesizers. So, um... Our boy Shane got a JX3P since this stream and, or since the last week's stream and uh, messaged me, hey, do you ever have problems with noisy chorus? So when you turn the chorus on, it sounds like noise is swooshing around. And I felt kind of bad because I uh, had heard that uh, JX3Ps and Juno 106s, all of those old roll-in synths with analog choruses, which this one doesn't have because it's all digital, but those chorus chips tend to go over time. And for whatever reason, the JX3P I have is uh, in mint condition, basically. It's like perfect. Um, You don't see them all the time like that. And, um, but that is a thing that can happen. So it, I think it is repairable. I think it's a thing, but it is, uh, kind of sad when you open up a synth and it's like, ah, oh, I wish, you know, you want that classic roll in chorus. And then it's like swishy, you know? So hopefully yours is still usable. Um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> let me know. You can hear how there's that like attack on the front. In 1987, this was crazy. Like no one had anything like this at the time. Uh, This was so kind of advanced. And um, this came out at a price of 1895, which is about what a Roland DX7 was. So they're definitely trying to hit that synth where it counts. And um, the D50 really is just this crazy um, piece of uh, a kit in the sense, but I, sometimes you'll notice I have to kind of like push my finger down because these membranes tend to go. So if you're looking at buying one of these, just be aware of the fact I would like message a reverb seller or whoever you're buying from like, hey, does every switch work? Does every key work? Because these tend to go over time. So I want to remember to always kind of cover uh, potential issues for people. It's interesting, you can pull it from the right to the left if you're listening in headphones or something.
Really cool. Tine wave. Kind of honky tonky piano type of sound. Like a little bit of vocal character actually. If you play it like that, like And you'll hear too that this is velocity and aftertouch sensitive. So I haven't really been messing with this, but seems like some modulation came in there. The aftertouch is super shot on these old synths. I don't know if that's doing anything. Uh, bad BBD chips. Yeah, for sure. 600 Canadian. I thought it was a great price. The swish bothered me for a minute, but I don't notice it now. You guys are telling me a lot of people were using a, a Dimension C pedal back in the day. What I've thought about doing uh, for a synth like that is getting a Boss CE3, I want to say. So CE1's way too expensive for anybody to buy for what it is. CE2 is the sort of uh, Boss, which is the same company as Roland chorus pedal guitarist to use, but the C3 has stereo outs. So you sort of get that roll in chorus sound and they usually can get them for like sub 200 bucks on reverb, something like that. So, um, definitely a thing. Um, and then there's a company actually, I believe that makes an extremely reasonably priced dimension C clone that you can buy brand new, uh, on Sweetwater. So you'd also look at that, but it's a rack mount unit. So you'd have to rack mount it somewhere. If that's something that you're interested in doing, Patrick, welcome to the stream. Very tonky, uh, moving right along here. Yeah. My seven key is kind of a little messed up. Sin harmonium. Yo, thank you for the $16 tip. Let me see what it says. Ah, love the new emojis and being part of a growing family. Thank you very much. I need to get like an extra monitor over here that I can move around so I can actually see what's going on a little bit better. Working on that, you guys. Um, thank you, whoever you are. It's really fucking awesome. I appreciate you guys. Appreciate everybody who signed up. I'll try to remember to use the mod wheel on this. Uh, so we're rock organ here. I, I really, I just don't get into organ sounds. Some people love organs. Maybe not my thing so much. Um, yes, yes, yes. All right, let's see what's going on. It's only in one ear. Uh, I said the CE3, uh, I believe is what it's called. Could be wrong, um, but that's a thing you could look into if you could get one cheap. A good place to look for vintage guitar pedals is the used section of Guitar Center. Uh, they have a lot of stuff and it's usually cheaper than you can get it on Reverb. A thing to consider. Yeah, organs have been a, such a mainstay in music, but I only dig a B3 tone wheel when Medeski plays them. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name right, but yeah, it's not my thing. Anyways, let's jump back to the first bank here and pull up what might be the most famous patch from the Roland D50. So this was also used in a million things. This is a crazy sound created by Fantasia. Maybe the most beautiful bell pad sound of all time. Uh, so let's go ahead and play something maybe not bad this time.
slightly less shitty than I usually play. Um, yeah, it's the best. <laughs> like, like, and I also think it highlights something about the D50 that I think is underrated. So what's interesting is, I mean, essentially a D50 is a virtual analog synthesizer. It was the first of its type. Um, and those synths are usually accused of being really cold and brittle and boring. But when you listen to this sound, it's full of life. And as I play lower, you can get some serious, you know, stuff out of this. That's a thick. I mean, I like them thick, and that's thick even for me. You know, like that's a really beautiful sound. And what's funny is, is that yeah, I mean, it's it's uh it's all digital, but for some reason, these early LA synths from Roland, the D50, and next week's stream we'll be doing on the JD800. Those synths just have this warm, uh, beautiful character to them. So, um, I meant I forgot to talk about this beer. So this cider is is uh, is actually pretty good. I'm not like a cider person, but it's not overly sweet. That's usually my fear with ciders. And uh, it's got a nice kind of zing to it, you know? Little almost like a Chardonnay-like zap. And uh, the pumpkin spice notes are there. They're not overwhelming. I could use maybe a touch more, but it's not really a complaint. Yeah. It is an ethereal quality, and that's another really important thing about this synthesizer that I forgot to mention, is that the D50 is, uh, I think, the first synth to ever ship with, like, onboard chorus delay and reverb and EQ and stuff like that. So, up until this point, if you wanted to have effects on your synth, um, you know, some of the synths, like the JX3P and the Chord Poly 6, they do have uh, uh, chorus, so... Without chorus and then with chorus, you know, for whatever that's work. Uh, let's see. You can hear it now. Um, but this synth is stereo, chorus, and reverb, and everything EQ. So all of a sudden, these sounds got very uh, wet and gorgeous, and you didn't need to have a outboard gear to make the sounds sound good. You know, all of a sudden you could get these really big reverby. Huge sounds. So, yeah, those low no notes do get very, very deep. Uh, okay, so let's catch up here. Mm. Nikki and I are playing a bird game while we watch this. Can you tell her to be nice to me, please? No, sir. Um, hey, Irish Musico, how's it going? Uh, that preset is a song waiting to happen. It really is. She's thick and beautiful. Hey, N Neil, how's it going? Welcome to the stream, my brother. Um, yes, I am absolutely one of those pumpkin spice people, Shane, for sure, for sure. Um, I, it's not fall without those pumpkin spice notes. Yes, fair point there. So let's uh, move right along to horn section. So again, you guys let me know what you think about the horn section here. You've heard a lot of brass synth sounds on this channel. So let's. What do you guys think? I think that that's pretty impressive. So again, we should be able to control this. And we've got trumpets up top here. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it's a X, it's just along the X axis here. So we got this sort of like sample. Yo, hey, BMAG, thank you for subscribing. That's awesome. Um, so you can already hear, so the samples on this are 8-bit, like us, I don't know, some of the other synths, the K1 comes to mind. You can hear it gets pretty floppy down here. You can hear the aliasing of those oscillators. It's actually pretty crazy. I always think of the D50 as sounding so good, but this sample is very lo-fi. You know, it's very uh, Insonic SQ80 or um, what's the other one I'm thinking of? You know, like the Insonic Mirage where it starts getting really grainy. Just completely destroyed. So we got that sound. It stops real quick and then here's the synthesis which is doing more like an Oberheim type thing. And then together. I mean, you've got like this incredible playability to it. Quite impressive, I think. Um, 240 AM. Just in from a gig. Oh, that's awesome. What kind of a uh, gig did you have? So, my good old Irish Music Co. Yes. Um, it does sound like horns. And I think that's the thing. Is this synth was the first synthesizer that sounded real. Right? That can't be overstated. Because everything in the 80s was trying to get to where soundtrack composers and things like that could actually use something like this to score movies and TV shows and stuff. And, uh, they did boy, did they ever with the D 50. Um, but the thing that's interesting about it is that it, um, it's, it, it's that combination of sample and synthesis is a sound all of its own. And it has this sort of organic character to it. Uh, so this is JX horn. So this is probably, probably based off of a, I'm guessing a JX 8P or a JX 10, not the 3P, because that was old news when this came out. Hearing that nice uh, PWM on it. That expressiveness, you know, is just not comparable to a string sound like from the Poly 6. I mean, I love how the Poly 6 sounds. By the way, that has external chorus and reverb on it. You can hear, I mean, the Poly 6 is a beautiful analog poly synth, but it almost feels like when you compare these back to back, this it's like missing maybe the, uh, the last part of that sound, right? Something like that. Oh, no, JX has PWM. That's a good point. Um, all right, so let's see. Let's see. Do, 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 do. It's lovely this time. Are you going to keep the D50? Will you buy the controller? So I've thought about getting a D-Tronics controller for it. Um, I think I might do that after I've made a shitload of sounds with the JD 800 because the JD 800, which we'll be covering next week, um, is the big brother to the D 50. It's the same type of synthesis, LA synthesis. They increased the samples to 12 or 16 bit and 
they put all of the knobs and faders on it. It's gorgeous. Can't wait for next week. It's intimidating, but awesome. Um, but it's hard to imagine ever selling the D50 just because it does have this unique sort of sound to it, you know? Like instantly nostalgic type sounds. Just uh, very beautiful to me. Uh, yeah, it's hard to lose that sort of a thing. Let's see. Yes, a huge rush for realism and synthesis at that time. Pink Floyd, ACDC, Dire Straits, Led Zeppelin. I love that. Uh, that's great. Um, yeah, and so, Dub, going to your comment about uh, pulse width modulation, it's actually possible to do pulse width modulation with a JX3P. I don't know if it's possible with the other ones. There's a trick to it that I don't know off the top of my head and I didn't learn for the stream, but you actually can use something like hard sync from one square oscillator to the other and uh, create it. My boy Madeira actually has a video up, I think with a JX3P on using pulse width modulation, but that's definitely the sort of um, Achilles heel of the JX series is without that pulse width modulation, that's kind of, you're missing that from the Junos. So those types of sounds. Beautiful brass sound. It's my favorite synth I never owned. Yes, and the Poly 6 is always lovely. I mean, it's not fair to compare anything to the Poly 6, but... You hear that kind of grainy reverb room sound. Yeah, it's uh, good. Let's move on to, this would also be maybe one of the most famous patches also programmed by Eric Persing. So Eric Persing's like impact on music cannot be understated. If you're not like a synth person, it might not be obvious, but to all of us in the synth world, Eric Persing did the patches on synths like the JX8P, the soundtrack patch there, um, the Alpha Juno Hoover sound, and then came to the D50. And the D50 was the first synth he was really involved with the creation of. And then he went on to found Spectrosonics, which is still making products today. And uh, some of the best products in the industry. Uh, I love all the sonic extensions for Omnisphere. Um, but what's interesting is the D50 and Omnisphere are not so different. Anyways, this sound he described as no other synth on the planet could do this sound at the time, so. That is crazy. So you've got these different layers. You've got these spectral waves they created for this. And then you've got those digital wavetables coming out that sound sort of like hand drums. And you've got that weird sort of pitchy thing. And so for me, this really begins the era of what I like to think of as like Eric Persing supremacy, where it's like no one could compete with this motherfucker. And um, in the same way that the Roland D50 is basically virtual analog synthesis with samples, he went on to form Spectrosonics in the 90s, uh, making sample CDs. And when he went on to make Omnisphere in 2008, he created a synthesizer that was effectively samples plus synthesis so this is like very much in his blood and it's uh kind of fun 
to go back and hear this. And, and in fact, for me, my vintage synth sort of journey started hearing the synth and going, you know, there's something about the sound of this that's different than, you know, even Omnisphere, right? And it's like, why is that exactly? What's different about this piece of hardware from 87 that makes it have a character? You would think in the digital domain, you should be able to t reproduce, um, you know, sounds uh, perfectly, um, you know, or like a, you should, it's basically like what people call a VST in a box, right? Well, but for this one, it's actually... Uh, there's something more than that. I don't know if it's the people always say like the DAC, the digital to analog converters. I don't know, but I'm not that excited by a marimba sound. Flute piano duo. Oh, interesting. We got this little E piano. <laughs> little uh type of sound so to really get in here on this uh number here oh there, there we are we were on that combi strings oh this is good this is kind of like a soundtracky type thing but with more realistic strings great so this is a good comparison of something to compare the poly six with some chorus and reverb on it to this so you know if we pick a sound and In terms of dynamism and realism and uh, just the immediacy of it, um, I'd like to point out that the cool reverb I have on the Poly 6 did not exist in 1987. Um, you know, this was a game changer for so many musicians because all of a sudden you sort of could open up these types of sounds that no one had heard before. And... Not that the Poly 6 can't sound great. But this was just a, a totally different world of high end and this sort of gritty digital thing, but it didn't have... The thing about the DX7 is, is it's mono. It's kind of flat. It's kind of boring on its own. You hear these sounds and it's like, holy fucking shit, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just a really great thing. Um, do I own any mono sense? Um, no, I don't actually. So I'm like a slut for big poly sense. I do think like some of the newer sense that I will purchase once I've sold a couple of cents will be more mono sense. Cause I want to kind of get into that world too. For me, I like big cinematic stuff. I want to be able to... play big uh, stuff. Uh, these are not good examples of big monos. Big sounds. Nylon atmosphere, this one sounds good.
really uh, gorgeous. And so that's how I like to play synths is, you know, be able to play some big, big chords and stuff like that. But I, as I've gone to sort of like do live looping stuff and streams where I'm actually making music, I'm like, a lot of the times when I want like a baseline sound, you know, I want to like come up with something. Let's see if I can find something. You know, and I want to be able to take that sound and then if like we slap, um, where is it, the unison mode on here and we can... those big beautiful uh unison sounds well you sort of you know that's where poly synths uh shine as those types of sounds so i'll probably get involved in this um this is like a scene where the karate kid realizes he's in love uh yes a lot of people everybody seems to love the sub 37 it's a very cool piece of uh instrument there um any mottos on the top of my list? Uh, per Fermenta Polyvox, um, Yamaha CS80, Yamaha SA, or I'm sorry, Roland SH2. So everybody wants an SH101 because it's got a sequencer. SH2 came out before it, doesn't have the sequencer, but it's got two oscillators, which that's my jam. Uh, I love two oscillators. I don't love a single oscillator in a sub. I know everybody does, but for me, I just don't find myself always loving those types of sounds. Um, so, okay, we got that one. Combi strings. I think we've moved through here. Oh, synthetic or electric. Got a nice little electric piano. I have to say, though, compared to a DX7, I don't think it sounds as good. Uh, breathy Chiffer. So this is an important one. Also, it's very much a Rolandy type sound. Gamelon Bell. Feel like we already hit that one. Slap Brass. So this is interesting. You can hear the crossfade. Instead of a traditional split where like one key is one thing and one key is the other. Here we've got a little bit of a fade. So you can kind of get away with playing a little bit more expressively if you want to. You know, you've got that control there, which is pretty neat. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, all my monos are Behringers. Yeah, I could see that. Or Behringer, as they uh, have a say nowadays. Um, everybody seems to love the micro freaks. You know, that seems to be a thing. Oh, Korg MS-20. Absolutely. That's definitely on the list of synths to purchase uh, mono synths. Let's see. A little sketchy build quality on the Uno. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, so, uh, look, mum, no computer says that a Korg MS 10 sounds better than the 20. Uh, that's an interesting sort of like discussion to have sometimes about how, um, certain, uh, sounds can be, uh, you know, this world of vintage sense and hardware sense is different than say the world of like who can make the craziest dubstep sound with serum where with there you've got like really deep synthesis like envelopes and macros and shit like that the world of hardware synths is much more about like the intrinsic qu quality of the components and something like an ms20 according to uh look mum no computer even though it's got better synthesis it doesn't have the sound and so it's kind of this funny romantic uh never ending sort of debate about which synth you want so this one's exciting pressure me strings we'll be able to check the aftertouch on this i bet yeah so the aftertouch actually does still work it's a little stiff
I gotta really jam my fingers into it, but it does work and you can hear how that upper octave comes in. You know, this is all shit that was not happening in 87, you know, it's really, really cool. Um, yeah, so very neat sort of instrument here. Let's go ahead and force this fucking thing in here. All right, rich brass. So one thing I can say is that there's certain sounds that I don't think the D50 does as well as say the Oberheim uh, Matrix, for instance. When it comes to brass sounds, I'm not as impressed. After touch works on this too, you can see. Sounds good, very expressive. Uh, patch one over here. Comparing these two very similar brass patches from the Poly 6 to the D50. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed that, but I actually like accidentally forgot the Poly 6 doesn't have aftertouch. And I like, leaned into it really hard to try to get it to make that sound. Um, aftertouch loosens up after a few drinks. <laughs> Body slams the synth. Yep, aftertouch works. That's so fucking true. Uh, let's move on to pipe solo. Oh, fuck yeah, I love this shit. This sounds terrible up here. Because you can hear the sample synthesis start to sort of fall apart, but... You know, a little bit of... So you can hear, here we have the synthesis. To me, sounds like a square wave or triangle wave with some pulse width modulation. Nice. Uh, and then here's the sample. You can hear, I think, that this, there might be actually two different samples here. Cause those both sound about the same length, but this sample is half the length of this one. So we know it's the same sample. So really tight. And then this one's half the length of this one or double the length and then four times as long. Right. Wow. You can really hear how terrible that sounds on its own. It's amazing to me how bad the samples sound, like even compared to the Insonic SQ80, like who, who thought that was going to be good enough <laughs> to ship. But when you mix it, it sounds great. I don't know. Yeah. Um, less detail. Yeah. So this is like the new world of like, uh, incredible. Uh, so we did soundtrack already and we did that already. So let's move on to over here. Um, it's a new world of like high end, right? Cause poly synths, uh, analog synths have trouble. Here's the thing. Let me turn the resonance and cutoff off. This is the sound of the sawtooth on the poly six. It's already dark and all you can do is make it darker. You can add some resonance. But it's never gonna not be dark and then someone like Roland comes along and they're like, shit, bitch. Too. 
Then you go back over to here and go. <laughs> it's just like not the fucking same, right? And I love analog synths. I'm not trying to sound in any way, shape, or form like I don't love analog synths. I've got more analog than digital in the room. But this was like... <laughs> Like, what the fuck? Like, can you imagine 1987 hearing this for the first time and, like, no one's ever heard sounds like this? Like, oh, my God. Autumn, I hope you have a wonderful night. Okay, I love you so much. Autumn's coming up, and it's already autumn the season. I meant to say Halloween's coming up. Have a great Halloween. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Just talk about a fucking thing. Let's go ahead and, uh, come on. There we go. Flutish Brass. Lots of, uh, new age records scored with shit like this. Pressure Me Lead. So again, we'll, we'll get to watch me body slam the synth. Oh, this is kind of cool because this reminds me a lot of the wailing guitar patch from the JD-800, which we'll hear next week. Where you can get those like crazy shrieking harmonics, you know, so you can get... Let's see if I mess with key mode. What is it that I'm looking for? I was trying to see if I could find a uh, way to make this mono for a second. Really cool. Really neat. All right, anyways, fuck this. Uh, let's do a classic off and on real quick. <laughs> uh, let's move on to Spacious Sweep. Oh, this one's good. So yeah, this synth has aftertouch. It's got velocity. It's got warmth. It's got brittle. It's actually very engaging, even in the warm territory, you know. Um, oh my God, a xenomorph. Love that so much. Z hasn't even seen it. He wants the costume. That's so good. This is one of the better patches. I forgot about this patch. Listening to this now. Really good. Piano 50. Not all that impressive. Uh, let's see. So that was that bank. Let's move back over here. Glass voices. I think we hit a bunch of these already. Yeah, I think we hit bank five earlier. Staccato Heaven, another famous patch that has got to be heard, used on a million 80s and 90s tracks. Yeah, just the sound of the 80s, right? Like, as soon as you hear that sound, you're like, oh, yeah, 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 it's that one. One of the most iconic sounds of the Roland D50. I mean, really just a joy to get to play. Uh, let's see here. Oriental Bells. Oh, that's so good. Makes you want to cry. Electric bass and electric piano. 
Couldn't get away from the slap bass in the 80s, right? Yeah, I just don't think this thing was meant to do um, electric pianos. Uh, they got better at it with like the Crystal Road sound in the JD 800s, great. But in this, not so much. Little string sound. It sounds pretty synthetic, but back in the day, you could probably sneak that into a uh, something and uh, actually get this. So Jack's horn strings, we already did that. Ah, the Sakuhachi! Yes! This is so important. That sound was used everywhere in the 80s. I mean, it's just such a famous sound. Uh, the sound of the 80s, probably 100 films and 100 songs at least. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so that was the Sakuhachi, the choir. We heard that earlier, I believe. Pick guitar duo. Okay, so moving right along to Nightmare. Let's see what this one's like. Kind of reminds me of um, of digital native dance, but just without all of the other bells and whistles. Um, did they use the synth for the living years? Sounds like it. I do not know. You guys probably know a lot more about that than I do, to be honest. Sin marimba? I don't care about marimbas. Slap, brat, bass, and... Slap, bass, and brass. God, I can't talk. We already slapped that shit around earlier. String Ensemble. Ooh, this one's pretty convincing, I think. No aftertouch, sadly. I'm sure you guys could see me try to uh, into that motherfucker, but. They also used a DX7 2. Mr. Mister? Not sure if the DX was on that track. Never mind, it was Mike and Mechanics. Interesting. That was quite a loud mic rub. But I mean, honestly, like in 87, you could probably like, if you had to sneak this in, like, so you're a composer for a movie and you fucked up. Like you thought you had it under control timeline wise. You get to the fucking orchestra, record the parts. And it's like, yeah, I fucked the strings up. I was fucking high as shit strung out. And it's like, what are we going to do? Well, pull up patch 74 and just, you know, kind of. Bullshit it in, right? You know, so this was definitely used a lot to uh, cover some asses in the 80s as well. Uh, that one's really good. Uh, 70, what was that? Oh, wait, I'm all fucked up. That was 74. 75, come on, let me in, baby. Let me in, 75. Yeah, I, I barely could get it in. I'm worried I'm doing damage to those knobs. Yeah, so this is a, a great, it's called Velocity Bass, and you can really hear. It gets powerful. Goes from very, like, kind of calm. Depending on how hard you hit it, that's a very uh, satisfying sound to play. Mm -hmm. 
is after touch sensitive. When I hear these types of brass patches, I always just think of Mario Kart 64. I don't know if that's just me. Maybe Mario Kart for the, uh, the uh, Super Nintendo. Digital cello. Kind of saxophony actually. So if we edit this and move this joystick, we can hear the different sounds. So this is the virtual analog. If you want to call it that, the sort of reedy type sound. Then over here we have the sample. Which is terrible. I actually think it sounds better with less of the sample, so... Like if you want like half as much as they had in the original patch. But on its own, I mean, who thought, again, who shipped this and was like, that's gonna be good. But somehow, the magic of this thing is you take a little crappy little sample. That doesn't make any sense why it should sound beautiful and like romantic and. <laughs> it shouldn't just turn into gold. Like that should totally be like not allowed. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Silent running. More of a fan of cool running. All right, so moving on along here to OK Corral. Whoa, that one's awesome. Really beautiful. Um, I was thinking OK Corral was going to be something like a honky-tonk piano, but that's actually quite... Let's pull this one apart. So over here... Oh, wow. So the sample doesn't track the keyboard. And then over here we have... VA. Assuming some square waves, pulse width modulation, chorus, good old recipe. Man, on its own, the sample again. Not that great, but with everything, it's like, wow. Just really gorgeous. Um, so I want to take a second here and actually, um, let's see. Some of the sounds are very familiar. Yes. <laughs> Make the best adult contemporary album ever. Yes. So, um, <laughs> you know, I feel bad. I don't want to just keep uh, getting people to buy synths. You know, part of this is for you guys to explore the sounds of these synths without having to commit to buying them. It's sort of like I spent the money so you don't have to. <laughs> But I have to say, the D50 is gorgeous. Issues. You'll notice I haven't really programmed anything. That's because programming on this is a nightmare. And I don't want to learn. It's that bad. And you can get the controller for it. That's something you can do. Uh, for me, that's, uh, that's a thing that I might do at some point. But in the meantime, it's like, uh, do I want to do that? And even once you do, you've got like four parts. So the synth is divided into, instead of like oscillator, filter, amplifier, you've got four of those, which is why there's so much complexity with the sounds. Sometimes you don't want to be spending all that time. So for me, something like the D50 sort of turns into almost like how I use a rompler where I'm like, I'm just going to pull up the preset I like and play that. I'm not going to try to program anything. Whereas something like a Poly 6 or even the JX3P with a controller becomes like an instrument where you're shaping the sounds uh, in the moment. So, you know, it's one of those things. Let's see. Uh, hey, Annie, how's it going? Good to see you the other day. I dropped in at where you work. 
Uh, you mentioned the JX3P being a hidden treasure that won't break the bank. Anything else you put in the category on the top of your head? Kawhi K3 did a video on that. That's probably the most impressive synth to me for the fact you can get them for like 300 bucks. That's pretty insane. What else would I say is in the best budget won't break the bank? I'm looking at my uh, Proteus Master Performance System plus orchestral, so it's a Proteus 1 plus the orchestral banks, which effectively makes it a Proteus 2, which is what they used to score the X-Files, and uh, also uh, the video game Myst uh, was used with this, uh, Rompler, and it's amazing. You can also get them sometimes for like as cheap as 300 bucks, one of my favorites. Uh, what else? I think the SQ-80 is underrated. Those go for more like $700. Let's see, looking around the room. Alpha Juno 2, amazing analog synth, but you've got a JX3P, so you probably don't need to overlap those. Uh, DW8000, very good, uh, but I'd probably go with the K3 over the 8000. And the Kawaii K1 is the poor man's D50. You can get those for sub three, like 200 bucks sometimes. And that one's really great. I saw on Guitar Center right now, they have a Kawaii K4, which is the uh, upgraded version of a K1. New patches, more polyphony probably, better sample bits. I like that the K1 sounds really crappy, like that dirty, gritty. It's like a D50 on meth, you know, like it just has edge to it. That's uh, I like. But for some people, like you could get a K4 and that kind of gives you those D50 type sounds, but very cheap. So that's a thing to think about. Um, anyways, let's go ahead and open this up. So. Underberg was nice enough to send me this package because we always drink Underbergs on the channel, which is super exciting. And I just want to take a second and like kind of highlight the artistry on this actual box is uh, really gorgeous just as its own statement, right? Like it looks really great. So let's open this up real quick and uh, see what they sent me and the whole scum family. But if there's anything in it, I will be the one to suck it. All right, so let's see here what else we need to do to get in. Oh, let's put this uh, knife away before I stab the wave station in the chest. <laughs> um, so opening this up, I've got an Underberg sticker. That's going right on the most expensive synth I have, for sure. Whoa, yo. Okay, let's just put that there. And a handwritten note, Alex. These videos are badass. Thank you for being such a loyal supporter. Anything we can help and some ideas, just any video, just. Wow, it's hard to read this, Pat. Patrick ba Brain, I appreciate you so much for writing this, but I'm. And. Ugh. It's hard to read this last part, but really awesome to get a handwritten note from this guy. Let's see if I can get this on camera well, or maybe it's easier to read if I pull it up over here. Look at that. Look at how fucking gorgeous that is to get a handwritten note nowadays. And inside we have, I'm presuming, a lot of Underbergs or something else maybe. I don't know, these beautiful little containers. I'm gonna pull this off here. Yeah, handwriting was a little rough, but look at this box. I mean, it's just like a piece of art. Maybe it's easier again if I hold it up over here. Look at this. What sweethearts. Inside we have Bunderbergs. Great, that's awesome. That's exactly what we need. That's enough for another 12 streams, so this is another 24. And hey, I got a little thing that says Berg Facts in here. 43, the beneficial effect of Underberg results from the power of selected aromatic herbs from 43 countries. 44, the aromatic herbs are married with 44% volume premium quality alcohol. 45, Underberg is perfectly served in a 45 degree angle, either straight from the portion bottle or served in the Underberg tall glass directly at the table. I've got one of those over there. I'll have to show them off sometime. Maybe I'll do it right now. 46, 
since 1846, Underberg has been produced based on the secret Semper Idem process, which guarantees always the same quality and effect. So, yeah. Drink bitter and keep smiling, guys. What sweethearts for sending this over to support the Scum family. You guys are great. Thank you very much, Patrick. I appreciate you if you watch this video. You guys are phenomenal. Fantastic. Phenomenal and fantastic all in one. What an amazing thing. Thank you guys very much. Let's see if I can get this to stick anywhere. Nope. <laughs> it all falls apart. So, last sound here. Pia pianissimo. Kind of like this one a little bit more. It's kind of like a little different than I was expecting. Up there. All right, well, we've covered that bank. Let's move on over here. We've got intruder effects. <laughs> Gotta have a good, whoa. <laughs> Gotta have a good sci-fi sound effect, right? Let's see, steel pick, I feel like this was used a lot. Synth bass. That is thick, guys. Play this riff that I did from the SQ80 video. Oof. It's got a lot of low end. And again, that's a thing about this synthesizer that I feel is important to talk about is the fact that it really does push a lot of uh, low end that you wouldn't expect from a virtual analog synth, basically. at the top end of this patch afterthought um oh other historical contemporaries of the guy who invented underberg that's awesome what a fucking moment in time all right so this is patch 85 bones oh maybe it's like trombones playing with the aftertouch here trying to see if it can get it to pop up a little bit more bottle blower another famous d50 sound mm -hmm. here's the synth here's the sample It's incredibly... It's incredible to me that it sounds so amazing. Because the sample on its own is so just butchered, you know. Absolutely. So it's something. All right. So we've got future pads. So this is what the future sounded like in 1987. So.
sort of like a little chiffy thing in there. Like vocal type tone, but up here it's really brassy. Then down here you get almost like the like... More of that sample brassy type thing. Very interesting, yeah. So, Donnie, welcome to the stream. How's it going, man? Welcome, welcome. It kind of modulates as you hold it. Like a little delay, delayed LFO action in there, so. Future pad. The Sound of the Future in 1987. Really cool. Uh, yeah, what's new? What's new? All right, I think this is the last patch. PCME piano. Pretty decent. Do you do any patch designing? Uh, not sure if I understand what you mean. Do I do any sound design stuff? Uh, so, like, I don't know. Maybe a dream of mine would be to get on, like, our friend Igor, his uh, site, NetLife Sounds. Like, he does a lot of uh, um, sound banks for different synthesizers and he does host some other sounds that were made by other people and uh so one day maybe i'll get some patches on there currently i don't have any products available if that's what you're asking i don't have any sorts of things um you know it would be fun to sit down with a d50 and a programmer and come up with like say 50 brand new sounds for the d50 but using that but the thing that i always worry about with that is that it's like how many people even have these nowadays, you know? So I am working on some stuff. There's some more stuff hidden away about that might be something vulture-y that we could turn into a product one day, but... Right now, uh, you know, I'm open to any opportunities. If you're out there and you're like, I want to get that motherfucker vulture culture making some patches, you know? Uh, that would be fun. So yeah, that would be a thing. I think I might try to sell some samples at some point, you know, make some sounds with uh, these synths because much more interested in making sounds with the Poly 6 than I am with this. One thing you could do though is you could route the Maudi, the Maudi, the MIDI out of the D50 and into the Poly 6 and then control both at the same time. That would be pretty sick. I don't know. So anyways, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to pull up some music here, chat about some stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get this party started. All right. So while we're messing around here. <laughs> Anyways, um, if you guys have any questions for me, now's a great time to ask. Um, but I'm going to just cover a couple of things before we close out the night. I think the D50 is one of the most iconic 
nostalgic, incredible pieces of equipment that ever existed. For me, the D50 is sort of like this magical thing that uh, has a sound that I don't want to fuck with. You know, when I hear the sound, I'm like, yep, yeah, that's it. You know, you hear Fantasia, right? You don't think to yourself, I could do better than that. No, that's the best that type of sound will ever be made, right? And that's what's so great about this synth. It has a vibe. Even though it's digital, it has a vibe. I asked earlier if like there's such a thing as like vintage digital. And people said, um, you know, there, there was like in the vintage synth group on Facebook, it was like 50-50. Some people are like, no, there's no way a synth that's like over 25 years old could be considered vintage digital, right? They're all about analog synths or something, or maybe some claviers, but not anything else. For me, this thing is like the height of vintage digital. Of course, the Yamaha DX7 is older, and it has certain sounds that we're all familiar with, but the DX7 like never sounded good, in my opinion. Like it always had that sort of cheap, plasticky sort of sound to it. Whereas the D50, I think, sounds amazing. And it's actually funny to me that like no one can kind of like make a plug-in. I mean, of course, Roland has, but like that there aren't modern versions of synths that sound like this. You know, when you get a virtual analog synth, it doesn't sound like this. I don't know why, but it's a thing. So anyways, um, I think we'll call it there for tonight. wanted to mention an amazing performance I saw the other day on YouTube. Hanya Rani, her KEXP performance, stunning, especially if you start listening at 10 minutes and 50 seconds. I'll check that out, Aquatic. Sounds great. So, uh, that's a great way to call it for tonight. I, uh, wanted just to say, let's see if I missed anything that I wanted to cover. Um, do, 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 do. No, I think I pretty much covered it. Uh, really excited for the direction this channel is going. You guys, have been incredible for supporting this movement we've created, the scum movement. And uh, memberships are just a new way for us to do that. And uh, if it's the type of thing you guys like, I'll keep doing it. If it's the type of thing you're like, I'd rather just send you five bucks than give it to you know the membership thing, we can do that too. Nothing wrong with that. But I think it's fun to have the badges and the, uh, the custom emoji and everything. I think that adds a lot to the experience of the channel. So you guys let me know what you think, okay? So in the comments below, in in the chat whenever I see you next let me know what you think about memberships if it's the type of thing you want this channel to go in if it's not don't be afraid to let me know I'm here to do stuff for y'all so you guys let me know and uh, with that I love you beautiful scum so much JD8 motherfucking hundred next week at 9 p.m. Eastern I'll see you then okay